Deuteronomy chapter number 12. As you're turning there, I'll give you a little bit on the book of Deuteronomy. It's an it's a unusual book. It's a book that has several distinctions about it. Uh, the children of Israel have been in the wilderness almost 40 years now. They've been in the wilderness 40 years because they didn't trust God. When they got to the wilderness, they sent in spies to go spy out the land. And of the 12 spies, only Joshua and Caleb come back and said, we can take it. But the other ten came back and gave a bad report. Now you've got to keep in mind, these people had been slaves and made bricks for 400 years. They weren't warriors. So don't throw off on them too much. I can imagine they were very apprehensive. How are we going to go in there and take... But Joshua and Caleb said, God said it's ours, let's go get it. You can never, ever outdo God, and you'll never go wrong trusting God. Well, they've come down to about that 40-year mark. Because of their unbelief, God made them stay in the wilderness till that generation died off. Now they're about ready to go in and get the land that God promised them some 40 years ago. And we have Moses, who's the writer of the book, Joshua and Caleb. God bless them. They're going to get to cross over because they put their faith in God, and then the rest of them are the children the descendants of those that didn't believe. Now, of course, if you're a student of the Bible, you know that because of this people, Moses continually dealing with their murmuring and complaining and their distrusting God, Moses in anger smote the rock, and he's not going to get to cross over. It's a dangerous thing not following God. So as they're about ready to cross over, the Lord gives Moses some final instructions for the children of Israel. He gives them some laws that they must obey. He also gives them some things, some warnings, and some things to look out for once they get over there. So with that in mind, in chapter number 12, let's begin reading verse 28. The Bible says, Observe and hear all these words which I command thee, that it may go well with thee, and with thy children after thee forever, when thou doest that which is good and right in the sight of the Lord thy God. When the Lord thy God shall cut off the nations from before thee, whither thou goest to possess them, and thou succeedest them, and dwellest in their land. Take heed to thyself that thou be not snared by following them after that they be destroyed from before thee, and that thou inquire not after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? Uh, even so will I do likewise. Thou shalt not do so unto the Lord thy God, for every abomination to the Lord which he hateth have they done unto their gods. For even their sons and their daughters they have burnt in the fire to their gods. What thing soever I command you, observe to do it, thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the good singing. God, thank you for all the good testimonies. Thank you for being a good God who hears and answers prayer. A good God who sustains your people and takes care of them. A good God that's worthy of our praise. And Father, we do bless your holy name. Now, Father, bless the reading of the word of God. Now we ask that you'd enlighten our minds, uh, and Lord, you'd stir our hearts for truth. And God, we pray that we'd leave forth from this place victorious. We'd leave forth with this place uh, with a vision. And Lord, we'd leave forth with this place with a burden to tell folks about the goodness of our God. Now, Father, bless those that could not be here, those that are sick, those who are providentially hindered, those who may be watching the live stream. God, we just pray that, Lord, you'd bless, uh, and God, you'd get glory to your wonderful and glorious name. Use this unworthy vessel now. We'll bless you and praise you for what you do, for it's in the holy 
and wonderful name of the Lord Jesus, we ask these things. Amen and amen. I'd like to draw your attention to a couple things as a way of introduction. First thing I'd like you to notice is there's a commandment to keep. Notice again in verse 28, he says, Observe and hear all the words which I command thee, that it may go well with thee and with thy children after thee forever, when thou doest that which is good and right in the sight of the Lord thy God. Uh, can I say, my dear friends, uh, it's always right to obey God. Uh, it's always right to keep the commandments of God. Uh, it'll not only be good for you, uh, it'll be good for your children uh, and your children's children. Uh, uh, there's nothing like uh, having the blessings of God in your life. Uh, and friend, it starts with uh, being obedient to what thus saith the Lord. Uh, so we see there is a commandment to keep. Uh, can I say, uh, we also find in these uh, uh, verses, there is a company to avoid. Uh, look with me, if you will, in verse number 30. The Bible says, uh, Take heed to thyself that thou be not snared by following them uh, after they be destroyed from before thee, uh, and that thou inquire not after their gods, saying, uh, How did these nations serve their gods? Uh, even so uh, will I do likewise. Uh, can I say not only is there a commandment to keep, uh, there's a company or a crowd uh, to avoid. Uh, just because they say they believe in God uh, don't mean that they believe and follow our God. Uh, and just because they go to a place they call church uh, doesn't mean that they're worshiping Almighty God. Uh, and just because uh, they sound like they know what they're talking about uh, doesn't mean uh, that God is in the midst of them. Uh, and can I say there is a company or a crowd uh, to avoid. Uh, we preached last week along those lines uh, in Romans 16, 17. Uh, now I beseech you, brethren, uh, Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, uh, and avoid them. Uh, uh, friends, uh, if they're not for the Bible, uh, if they're not for the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, if they're not for holy living and old-fashioned worship, uh, we're to avoid them. Uh, friend, a little leaven leavens all up, uh, and if you get involved with them, they'll drag you away from the presence of God. Uh, there is a commandment to keep. There's a company to avoid, but notice there's a compliance to be observed. Look in verse 32. What things soever I command you, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. God said, if I said it, that settles it. I'm not interested in your opinion. I'm not interested in what uh, 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 somebody else says. Uh, uh, whatsoever I say unto you, uh, do it. Uh, don't add to it. Uh, don't take away from it. Uh, kind of reminds me of Re Revelation 22:18. Uh, For I test unto you, uh, testify unto you, uh, uh, unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. Uh, if any man uh, shall add unto these things, uh, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. Uh, and if any man take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, uh, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, uh, out of the holy city. Uh, and from the things which are written in this book, uh, we're not to add to or take away from the Word of God uh, or the things of God. Uh, God, help us to realize there is a compliance uh, to be observed. Uh, so these verses are very clear. I'm interested again in verse number 30. He said, Take heed to thyself that thou be not snared by following them. Uh, uh, and then he goes on in verse 31, that thou, uh, thou shalt not do so unto the Lord thy God uh, for every abomination to the Lord which he hateth have they done unto their gods uh, I want to preach with God's help this evening on beware of following after the enemies of God hey uh, friend uh, God said either we're for him or we're against him there is no gray area with God uh, and folks either people are for the things of God uh, or they're against the things of God uh, Partial obedience is still total disobedience. Uh, and hey, uh, there's a lot of folks claiming, uh, I'm talking about Baptist folks claiming they're for God uh, when really they're against God. Uh, and these verses give us a warning uh, where to beware of following after the enemies of God. Uh, 
why they'll ensnare you. Is that not what verse 30 says? Take heed to thyself that thou be not snared uh, uh, of following them, by following them. Can I say, first of all, they will ensnare you to compromise. No one ever just one day woke up and believed something different than they was raised to believe. They were ensnared to compromise. For example, they'll cause you to compromise the Scriptures. Can I say this? People have to be taught out of the King James Bible. Lost people know the King James Bible is the Word of God. Even Linus from Charlie Brown knows the King James Bible is the Word of God. Huh? Can I say that people that once believe the truth, knew the truth, carried the truth, uh, but today they talk about a different version of the Bible. Uh, can I say there is the Bible and then there's versions? Versions are perversions. You just need the Bible. God pinned down the Bible uh, and He gave it to us. Uh, all 66 books, uh, all 1100 plus chapter, uh, all 773,000 plus words, uh, they're inspired uh, by God. Uh, hey, the Bible doesn't contain the Word of God. Uh, it is the Word of God. Uh, you don't need to look for any other. Uh, you've got it. It ought to be the absolute and final authority of your life. Uh, but they'll listen to somebody that'll say it's got 30,000 errors, hogwash. They'll listen to somebody that said, well, in the original Greek. Now, first of all, if you hear that red flags ought to go up and fireworks ought to go up in your life, because if anybody's talking about the originals, that's a heretic. Nobody's seen the originals. You do understand that when the Apostle Paul pinned down the epistles the Holy Ghost inspired him to write, he wrote them on sheepskin. 2,000 years later, there are no more sheepskins. They dried up, cracked, and broke. That's why they constantly uh, uh, recopied the Word of God and why God preserved it for you and I. Can I say this? My dear friends, don't put your stock in something called the Red Sea Scrolls. I don't need the Red Sea Scrolls. I've got the Word of God. Don't put your stock in anything that will cause you to question what God said. Mm -hmm. You're being ensnared by following the enemy of God. Anybody wants to change God's word, they're an enemy of God. Mm -hmm. uh, it kind of reminds me, I heard this one time where, you know, scientists back in the 70s started making test tube babies. Mm -hmm. They could take a, a, an egg and they could fertilize it in a test tube and grow a baby. So they said, we don't need God. So they challenged God. And they said, God, we can make man just as good as you. And so scientists reached down to grab some dirt and said, whoa, 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 whoa. God said, get your own dirt. See, God made everything from nothing. When you start questioning God, you're like a scientist. You become God in your own mind. Mm. And can I say... They'll ensnare you to compromise the Scriptures. They'll ensnare you to compromise sound doctrine. Doctrine is the teaching of the Bible. You know why people believe in speaking in tongues? Because somebody told them that it was something they could have. Yet they don't study the Bible. The Bible says, When that which is perfect shall come, that which is in part shall be done away with. Just before that it says, Tongues shall cease. I don't need to speak in a tongue. I can't even speak English. See, those that say that, uh, that you can speak in tongues, they talk about a bunch of jibber-jabber nobody understands. Uh, but if you understand the Bible, when it mentions tongues, it mentions languages. And the reason uh, the apostles had the ability uh, uh, to speak in other languages, even though they never studied or learned them, God gave them that gift uh, so people in the crowd who couldn't speak Hebrew or Greek, uh, they would hear the Word of God in their own language. Can I say? When that which is perfect shall come, that which is in part shall be done away with. We don't need to speak in other languages in a congregation because now that which is perfect has come, the Word of God. And now it's being printed in every language you can just about think of. Can I say? The universal language used to be 
English. Mm -mm. You're welcome. But they'll cause you to compromise sound doctrine. They'll tell you you can lose your salvation. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says he gave me everlasting life. The Bible says I'm in his hand, and his hand's in the Father's hand, and no man can pluck me out of the Father's hand. Ah, I have everlasting life. Thank God for the security of the believer. Brother Tommy, if I had to keep myself saved, I couldn't do it. But I'm glad he saved me. Ooh, they'll, they'll cause you to question the doctrine you've been taught. They question the autonomy of the local church. There's been a big push from the ecumenical movement for us all to lay down doctrinal differences and come together and sing kumbaya and hold hands. Well, I can't hold hands and worship if somebody don't believe the Bible. I can't hold hands and worship if somebody prays to Mary. I can't hold hands and worship with somebody that believes you can lose your salvation. You see, they want you to compromise your belief. Why don't they just start believing the book and we can, we can have a good time? Huh? Do you realize every false and damnable doctrine that is being taught in so-called Protestant churches are less than 150 years old? Can I say, the first year anybody ever spoke in tongues in America was in 1901. It was also the first year the first false Bible was printed in America. That ought to tell you all you need to know. Hmm? I'm glad I got the truth. And I say what we believe has been around since Jesus walked on the earth. Mm. Well, I can go on for hours on all that. They'll just ensnare you to compromise. I can't do it, Phil. I'm old. I got a whole lot to get, can, continue with here. They'll ensnare you to compromise their service styles. They don't like old-fashioned singing. They don't like old-fashioned testimonies. They don't like old-fashioned preaching. They want to have a rock band. They want to have the, the lights darkened and have smoke and have neon lights on the platform. Uh, 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 they want to have uh, 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 somebody sitting on a stool holding a microphone in their hand telling you how good you are. Can I say, that all kind of resembles a rock concert. And can I say, God saved us out of that mess. Church of God should be well lit. By the way, none of them carry a Bible in there. You couldn't read it if they did. Huh? Their revivals are called laughing revivals. They laugh all the time. Boy, just, you know, they, they just start breaking out in laughter, and that's revival. One fellow preached on hell, and he's laughing at it. Hell's no laughing matter, friend. And I say their revivals consist of dancing. They want to dance. And dancing's for the... Uh, uh, the bars and the joints, the house of God's for worship. Now, when David danced before the Lord, he's because he's so full of God, he got the big can't help it. He was just like the fella uh, uh, that was lame, and uh, Peter and John healed him, uh, and he come leaping and praising God in the house of God. Uh, 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 he wasn't there for a spectacle to draw attention to himself. Uh, he just had a big case of the can't help it, uh, and God was so good to him, he just had to tell somebody. I studied it out one time. I forget how many. I, I think David stopped in worship, built an altar and worship and sacrifice some 6,000 times before he got to Jerusalem carrying the ark. When you start offering up that kind of sacrifice and start worshiping that much, by the time you get to where God's at, let me help you something. You're going to have a time too. Uh, just think about it. Every, every quarter of a mile on the way to church, you stop, got out, and just worship God. By the time you get here, you'd be broke out in worship. Are you listening? Uh, they want you to change your service style. Let's all have a screen with all the words to these courses that just repeat themselves 600 times. Hmm? Does not the Bible talk about vain repetitions? Hmm? You know why they don't want you to have a songbook? Because the people that wrote them hymns in that songbook knew God. And the words in those songbooks uh, will give you conviction in your soul. They don't want that. They want a window wash. And then they do this brazen their neck. What in the world is that? I'm just channeling in the Spirit. Well, I got good news for you. He lives in me. I don't have to channel him in. I'm trying to work him out. 
No. Uh, they don't want you to compromise your standards. They don't want you to go to church on Wednesday night. Nobody has church on Wednesday night. Didn't we hear that tonight in testimony? The lady was shocked. You got church on Wednesday night? Yeah. Why don't you? See what Baptists have always been? We still are. Mm -mm. But they want you to compromise your stand on the things of God, compromise uh, your standards of your character, your walk, your talk, your speech, everything. Uh, uh, it amazes me even Southern Baptist churches now have no problem with you taking a little social drink. It isn't right. Hmm? Calvinistic Baptists have no problem with you having real liquor in the Lord's Supper. Uh, you don't think liquor will harm you. Talk to this man right here. Talk to some others that used to be controlled by that one right there. I never want to hear of these boys ever putting their mouth to, to a bottle of liquor, but I sure wouldn't want it to happen in the house of God. I just want you to compromise your standards. Hmm? I don't understand the laws of fermentation. Whenever you find wine in the Bible and it's around God's people, they're talking about the fruit of the vine. They're talking about what we call Welch's grape juice. Uh, wasn't intoxicating. That's the stuff that sat around for a while. And that's the stuff that was poisonous. Well, they want you to compromise that. They want, to, want you to compromise going to church three times a week and going to Sunday school and studying your Bible and praying and all because Jesus understands. Now, Jesus don't understand why we don't have church more. Beware of following after the enemies of God. They'll ensnare you to compromise. Can I say this? They'll ensnare you to become corrupted. They want to make you defiled. They want to make you sinful. You know why? Because when you're sinful, you feel guilty. And when you feel guilty, you feel guilty facing God. You feel guilty facing God's people. I know people, my mind's reeling right now. I know people that's not in church tonight. And they're not in church tonight, not because they don't, they, it's not because they, they don't know that we love them. They know we love them. It's not because they don't know they'd be welcome. They know they'd be welcome. But they feel guilty because they became sinful and they feel guilty facing us because they haven't been here all along. That's what sin will do to you. It'll defile you. They know deep down in their heart they can't be what they once were because sin always comes with a price and it always will scar you. Can I say the scar is a sign that it's been healed but you still carry the scar. Mm. They want you to become corrupted. They want you to become defiled. They want you to become disingenuous. They want you to not be real. You know what the window washing crowd hates about us? We don't have to be pumped up to worship. We can come out on a Wednesday night when you've got too much world in you and you're wore out and you get in the parking lot and you put one foot in front of the other, but when you walk in them doors, the, there's something gets to stirring on the inside of you, somebody gets to singing, somebody gets to testifying, you get fired up, huh? See, they don't have that. They've got to be pumped up. And they want you to be fake like they're fake. Hmm. I don't know if you heard about my buddy Joel. Brother Tommy sent me a wonderful, wonderful little thing about him. You know, I don't know if you know this. I've seen it in Houston, Texas. Joel bought out the convention center. That's his church now. And he's, he did that 20 years ago. And Joel, having a, can you imagine having a convention center downtown Cincinnati? That's where we worship. Of course, he charges $10 a head to get in. They didn't want you to buy all his books because it's a money-making outfit. Well, he's having a little plumbing issue, I guess. 
They brought in a plumber, and a plumber found $600,000 hidden. You say, what? It's called money laundering. It's not being reported. Are you listening? It was unaccountable. It was Joe's private stash. That's what it was. Huh? They're all fake. Fake. They want us to be fake. Because every day we stay real, we're testimony against them. When we didn't close for COVID, we was a testimony against them. When we didn't bow down and kiss the Pope's ring, we're a testimony against them. When we aren't like them, they hate it. You better beware of them. Because they do sound like they know what they're talking about. Can I, on a side note, just throw that you all know one of our favorite missionaries, Brother Rom and Guyana. God's a blessing down there. They're planting another church, and they're building the church, and God's really blessed. He sent me a thing last night. He is now allowed on Wednesday mornings to preach on the largest TV station in Guyana. And I mean, he's a shucking the corn on there. But I accused him of being Joe Osteen Jr., you know. I said, I, I'm, I'm glad I've got a friend who's a TV evangelist, you know. I've been giving him the business. He's going, no, preacher, no, preacher, no, preacher. Uh, but isn't that a blessing God's using? There's somebody real on TV. Uh, but oh, they want you to become corrupted. They want you to be defiled and disingenuous. They also want you to be disillusioned. They want you to have some self-righteousness about you. You see, what preaching does, preaching will confirm or convict it'll charge you or to convict you and see when you get under conviction it ought to humble you you ought to be thankful that God sent a message to show you where you really are so you can get right with the Lord and be where God wants you to be that's why he sends conviction mm, but when you're full of pride, conviction makes you mad. Who's that preacher think he is? Huh? But what happens is when you get pride, prideful, and you, and you get filled with all that indignation, you become self-righteous. I'm not going to get right. I'm not going to do what that preacher says. I'm not going to do what them church people expect. I'm not going to do it. I'm right and they're wrong. That's exactly where they want you. Mm -mm. Listen, I've said this for years. There's never been a preacher preached too hard to me. Now, I'm not talking about hateful preachers. There's some of that blood and guts hateful preachers, not Bible preachers. I wouldn't give you two cents for them. But I'm talking about a man of God. Stand up with the Spirit of God on him, with love in his heart, preach this book. He's never preached too hard to me. And if he... Uh, I absolutely stomps on my toe if he stomps on my head. I'm going to thank God for the message. I'm going to try by the grace of God to get right with God. And when the service is over, I'm going to hug his neck and thank him for preaching that way to me. I've never seen the likes of people. When preaching gets on, they get mad. Hmm? They're just revealing what's in their heart. Can I say? They want to ensnare you to compromise. They want to ensnare you to become corrupted because when you're self-righteous, you're not giving God any glory. They want to ensnare you to become complacent. If there's any indictment of our day and age is people have been lulled to sleep. We've been increased with goods and have need of nothing. We think we're okay. We don't even know how far we are from God. Hmm? Brother Ray and I was talking yesterday. By the way, Brother Ray is the new Brother Charlie. Do y'all remember Brother Charlie? Brother Charlie used to come out here all the time. You know, we talked and everything. Never got anything done with Brother Charlie. Right now, Brother Ray's Brother Charlie Jr. Huh? No, he's not. He's not. He comes out here and he works. Brother Charlie, he, he didn't have anything to do. He just came out. But we was talking yesterday. Churches we was raised in. Wasn't any carpet on the floor? 
What any padding on the pews? Miss Lynn, you remember the old pine pews? You remember we the youth, you know, we raised money to get the nice pews. We remember the old pine ones. You didn't slip down in them not off sleep. You get splinters, man. They was whoo. That's one I got in trouble in because when I got the, the pocket knife and I carved my initials in the pew, not a good thing to do. No, not a good no, that wasn't good. I paid for that one. Hmm. You boys in here do not carve up these pews. Brother Ray will snatch you up and wear you out, all right? Uh, but oh, had pine pews. They weren't comfortable. And by the way, they didn't care what time it was. We were on God's time. Uh, hey, in the wintertime, I had an old oil furnace. It wouldn't, it wouldn't warm that place. And, and listen to me, ladies. No lady dare carry the blanket in there. You just sat there and froze. Kids didn't lay around on the floor either. You'd have froze to death on that tile floor, I guarantee you. Summertime, wasn't no air conditioning. Had funeral fans in the pews. They'd crank out the windows, and you wouldn't get a breeze. I mean, you put about 250 people in that place, and man, you're sweating on other people's sweat. I'm telling you, it's bad. You didn't get up and go to the bathroom unless you had to go because it was out back. And there wasn't no lights. And most of the time, wasn't any toilet paper. So if you had to go, you really had to go. Wasn't no water fountains. He said, that was horrible. No, you know what we had? God. Brother Ray and I was talking about it. I remember many times you'd come in the church house uh, and there's folks that had gathered early and there was somebody on the piano and they're up there all around the piano. Uh, they got the hymn books up there just singing. Uh, uh, the folks come in, they started joining in. Uh, uh, by the time uh, service started, folks were in the altar. Folks were worshiping. Uh, it already got on. Uh, you didn't know if you was having Sunday school first or worship first. Uh, 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 you better be ready. Uh, uh, there wasn't no 10 o'clock service, 11 o'clock service. Uh, it was all on God's time when God showed up. Uh, folks Folks were ready to worship. Uh, and folks wasn't getting saved about every week. Uh, folks were in the altar begging God, am I the reason nobody's getting saved around here? Uh, they took it serious. Uh, I mean, there were folks uh, didn't have two nickels to rub together, uh, uh, but they'd find themselves in the house of God. Uh, they'd come ready to worship, praise God for the two nickels they did have. Uh, and God blew through that place. Uh, now we've got all the conveniences. You know, one of my regrets is I don't have any preaching of my granddaddy on tape. Because we didn't have that stuff back then. We just barely had microphones. But we had God. Now we have everything, but very little God. Mm. And that's what they want. They want you to become complacent, be satisfied where you are. You ought to never be satisfied where you are. You ought to always be looking to know more about the Lord. You ought to always be looking to get closer to the Lord. You ought to always look for more from God. Never get satisfied where you are. Can I say they will ensnare you to become copious? That's a big fancy word for being driven by materialism. So many people, all they're concerned about is material things. You do know that one day everything in this world is going to be burned up. Everything. Now, I'm not saying have nice things. If God's blessed you to have nice things, that's a blessing you ought to thank God for them. But those things ought to not become your God. You ought not be signed up to work extra so you can have things. If you're going to sign up to work extra, you ought to sign up to work extra so you can give more money to missions. Things that matter. Hmm? They want to ensnare you to become so materialistic. Can I say this? They want to ensnare you to become, or to embrace cult worship. Look again at verse 30. I'm almost done, but I'm not. Notice Miss Crystal didn't laugh on that. Called her out the other night. Look at verse 30. Take heed to thyself that thou be not snared by following them, after that they be destroyed from before thee. And here it is. And that thou inquire not after their gods saying, How did these nations serve their gods? Even so will I do likewise. Can I say? They want you to embrace cult worship. 
they want you to find no fault with their window washing and all their junk. Hmm. Again, there's only one true and living God. And he's worthy of all our praise, all of our worship, all of our attention. There ought to be no room for any other gods in your life. Can I say they want to ensnare you to become critical? I've never seen a time where so many of God's people are critical. Miss Nett's got a great rule. Anybody that's ever sat in her Sunday school class knows it. If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. Hmm? How many kids have heard that in Miss Nett's classroom? Look at them. Huh? How many of you have you had to hear it more than once? Because you, yep, you've got one honest in the whole bunch, Xander. Huh? Yeah. And I say we got folks that have become so critical in the house of God. So negative. So vile. Spew venom. Can I say, Jesus said that the world would know that we're his disciples because we have love one for another. You wonder why they're not flocking to our churches? They're not seeing that. But they're hearing a whole lot of junk. Hmm? This ought to be one of the most wonderful places in the world. We can come amongst God's people and love. And by the way, you ought not be critical because God may just have their mansion right next to yours when we get to heaven. Huh? What can I say? Folks become critical of God's people. Let me help solve this equation right here. There's not a halo in the house. Nobody's perfect. And can I say... And on a bad day, anybody can do anything. You're not to judge them. The Bible says not that we're not to judge another man's servant. They belong to God. Let me help you something. God will take care of them. It's not your job to take care of them. You can't even take care of you. Uh, so don't become critical. Don't judge them. Here's what you need to do. Pray for them. Love them. In spite of them. Because that's what Jesus did for you. Huh? Be good to them. Say, well, I don't like them. Well, they probably don't like you either, but be good to them anyway. You know what the Bible said? You want to have friends, you must show yourself friendly. So why don't they like me? Because you're not friendly. You're too critical. Huh? They want you to become critical. They ensnare you to become critical. Critical of God's people are critical of God's pastor. You wouldn't believe some things have been said about me over the years. Huh? Some of them's comical. You know, I've been, been told that I didn't use the King James Bible. It's in the carpet. It's on the wall. It's what I carry. Huh? But I don't use King James Bible. Hmm? And anything, I've been called racist. Go talk to my most southern brethren back here. Now speak up, boys. How many white folks are in y'all's home church? None. How many times I've been there? A few times. Yeah, huh? Have I worn a KKK hood and burnt a cross outside? I love on your people, and your people love on me. You know why? Because the Spirit of God lives in both of us. But I've been called a racist. Why would their daddy, who's a godly man, send his sons to come up and come to our church if I was a racist? Uh, it's crazy. But I've been called a racist. I've been called everything. Trust me, man. I've been called everything. Now listen, here's the reality of it. But Jim, you can talk about me like a dog. And it, it really, I, to say that it doesn't bother me, it does, I want to be liked by everybody. But 90% of it rolls off my back like water on a duck's back. It really does. Because if I got caught up in all that, I'd, I'd, I'd have quit a long time ago. But the reality is, Brother Jim, if you talk about me like a dog, you're going to have to take it up with God. Because I'm God's man. 
And he said not to lay hands on God's man. Hmm? And you 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 got to be real careful how you treat God's man. Matter of fact, he said God's man's worthy of double honor. It means no matter how much you honor anybody, God's man's worth double that. So it's it's very dangerous to be critical of God's man. Now listen, if I'm out of the will of God, God will take care of me. Trust me. Uh, but as long as I'm following God, you're to follow me because I watch for your souls. People have no idea. Most of the time, Miss Annette's asleep late at night, 2.33 in the morning. I'm awake because I'm worried about somebody in the church, praying for somebody in the church. They have no idea. But can I say, that's the calling God put on my life. I do not do it with regret. I do it with joy. I'm not worthy of what God allows me to do. And I love the church that God has allowed me to pastor. I love you, dear folks. I thank God for you. Proud of you, dear folks. I don't understand why you keep coming back and hearing me preach. I really don't, but I'm sure glad you do. Huh? Be real lonely without you, huh? But there are folks who are critical against God's man and have never once even considered all that he really does. Critical of God's people. Critical of God's pastor. Critical of God's purpose. I've had people get upset when we went to build this building because they didn't want us to grow. I said, so you don't want to be biblical. Because we're to take the gospel to every creature, and it's God's will for us to grow. Grow in the grace and knowledge and admonition of the Lord. And so you don't want us, well, I just don't want to get any bigger. No, you're lazy, and you're unbiblical. Huh? Can I help you with something? I want every person in Florence, Burlington, Union, and Hebron to get born again. And I really believe the best church in the area is ours, so I want them all here. I don't know how we deal with them all, but I want them all here if God sends them, huh? You say, Preacher, what would we do? I don't know, but I'd sure like to find out. Uh, it wouldn't last long, about three services. I'd run a lot of them off anyway, but that's another. But they want you to become critical. That's what they want you to do. They just want you to have a foul, nasty spirit. Can I say a Christian ought to never have a foul, nasty spirit? Good as God's been to us, we ought to have a blessing spirit. Hmm? Well, then I thought about this. They want to ensnare you to cease. They just want you to quit. Just quit. Just stop. Can I say from the pulpit to the back pew and even up there in the crow's nest with the guys that always look down on us, that critical message part was from them. But anyway, can I say for everybody in here, every one of us, somewhere along the line, have had an excuse to quit. And most of you have been justified other than the fact that Jesus loves you and what he done for you. But if you get to look at people, you have a reason to quit. That's why we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. They want you to quit because every day you live for Jesus, you're an indictment against them. You remind them how defeated they are. Well, preacher, how can I avoid this crowd? Real simple. Observing God's Word. Verse 23 and verse 32, we're reminded to observe it. Just observe it. Keep the Word of God fresh in your heart, fresh on your mind. Observe it. Here next week, we'll observe Christmas. You'll gather with friends and family if the Lord's provided, you'll exchange gifts. You'll have some fellowship. That's observing the holiday. You're to observe God's Word. Make time and a place in your life for God's Word. If you observe God's Word, guess what? You'll not be tempted to, to not believe it. It'll become part of you. We're to be ob obedient to God's will. We know it's God's will that none should perish, that all should come to repentance, but it's also God's will for us to live godly, sober, righteously in this present day and age. But we're also, you can avoid them by opposing their ways. If you avoid them and their ways, then you won't be hooked by them. Listen, I've never taken a drink of liquor. Never have. 
Now, I've drank some NyQuil, but I've never drank any liquor. All right? You know what drinking NyQuil told me? It's a good thing you were saved because you'd be a whiskey drinker. People say, oh, I hate the way that burns. I kind of like it. So that's, that's why I run from liquor. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Guilty right there all over your face. NyQuil queen right there. Huh? You shouldn't have done that. Glendale and Dougie's not written yet. That might stick. Miss Lisa's going, hallelujah. Huh? I've never drank any liquor. I don't go into bars. Because if I go into bars, I might get tempted to drink liquor. Are you listening? See, you stay away from their ways. I don't go to any of these false churches. Say, well, they're having a big Christmas program. Happy, 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 happy. I can watch Hallmark and have all the Christmas I want to have. You know what I'm saying? By the way, GAC is better this year than Hallmark. If you haven't got into GAC, watch GAC. The movies are better. Huh? They're not all about the love flakes. Okay? But listen, I'm not going to go to their Christmas programs. I'm not going to go to their events. Because if I do, I start having empathy for them. The Lord said, come ye out, be ye separate, saith the Lord. I'm not going to their crowd. I'm not doing it. I'm not going to their concerts. I'm not going to their events. Because if I do, it might cause me to become ensnared. Some of you have a real problem when I preach on certain things because you like it. You would have never liked it had you not been ensnared by it. See, if you keep yourself pure from a lot of their stuff, they won't ensnare you. They won't get their hooks in you. Hmm? Miss Annette used to tell the kids all the time, if you never try it, you'll never know if you liked it. Hmm? I'm trying to help you tonight. Oppose their ways. Don't get caught up in all that they do. Who cares what they do? Uh, I'm more interested in what Jesus wants me to do. I don't really care what they do. Uh, it's not important to me. What's important to me is one of these days I'm going to stand before the Lord. I'm going to give an account of this book, give an account of His will, and give an account of how much I've let them influence me over Him. God help us. Beware of following after God's enemy. There's a lot of them out there. As we sit here tonight, there's 300 different religions and denominations in America. How come there's that many religions and denominations when there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one book? i tell you why. Because there's a sorry devil who has tried to deceive people. And he's been very good at it for a long time. And friend, you're no match for him. He'll deceive you too. You give him an inch, he's going to take a mile. I'd rather stick with Jesus. I don't know why God gave me this message this week, only to think that maybe he's trying to warn us not to get caught up with something that's not of him. Let's all stand, Brother Clint, get a song with you. Maybe you need to come and thank the Lord you're in the right church. Maybe you need to come and thank the Lord for being so good to you. Maybe you need to come and pray for somebody that's caught up in false churches. Maybe somebody's out of church and God's put them on your heart. You need to come pray for them. Maybe tonight you just need to come tell the Lord you love him. I don't know. But if he spoke to your heart, you just mind the Lord. Folks are coming. They're picking out a song. When they're picking out a song, let's pray. Father, we bless you. Thank you for truth. Lord, we never have to apologize for the truth. Thank you for it. God, I pray for those that have been deceived. Lord, I pray that, Lord, you'd open their eyes to truth. Lord, I'm not against people who've been deceived. I'm against, Lord, the methods, and I'm against the deception itself. But God, I feel for them people, and I pray for them. I pray you'd open their eyes to truth. Now, God, help us to keep our eyes on you. Help us, Lord, to follow after thy word and thy will. God, help us to impact this world you've blessed us to live in. Help us to shine His light. Help us to avoid becoming complacent, critical, and all those things. Help us, Lord, to be Christ-like. 
Now, God, have your way in this invitation. These in the altar, whatever they're here for, bless them and help them. God, those praying in the pews, bless them and help them. Now, God, get glory to your name. We'll thank you for it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you enjoyed today's message, head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on sermons. And don't forget to check out our other links in the notes section of today's broadcast. As always, thanks for listening.